of worship through studying God's Word. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity, the privilege that we have to be together in this house of worship. Uh, thank you, I thank you for each one who's gathered here to uh, worship you, to worship your Son, Jesus Christ, and to feel and know your Spirit uh, in our hearts and our lives. Help us to open our minds and our hearts to you as we, uh, again, study your word today and we seek to know your will for our lives and for your church. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we're um, wrapping up the series of messages on uh, the love month and the study of God's love. Last several weeks, we've We've uh, examined agape love, not an examination of the different Greek words for love, but we saw how God surrounds us with His love that uh, is, is, a great, is a love that brings us back to Him, but also it's not just a, agape love is not a feeling love, but it's a love that is action and and we show that God took action, and uh, then He expects us to. We looked how, at how someone needs us, someone needs you today, and we looked at every one of those words as an infinite em emphasis in God working through us. And then last week we looked at the topic uh, with the title of I could or I could, so that we could examine how we could live our lives and act and put feet and flesh on God's love, or we could do things for uh, our own selves and in a selfish way. Today, uh, our topic or our title, as you see in the bulletin, is a new kind of love. It's not new, and we're not changing from the agape love. We're just examining how this was a new kind of love that Jesus showed to the people in his day. Uh, the, 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 the people in biblical times knew very well what it was to, to have the brotherly love, the family love, the, the eros, the erotic, the, the sexual love. And they claimed to have godly love. We'll take a look at this passage in Luke chapter 19 and see if they really knew what that was like. So as we think about this, we know that, that uh, as we think of this new kind of love, we realize that to even today, some people base their love on, uh, or their love of other people on their future potential uh, or their continued performance. It might be, uh, uh, we begin a sentence or we begin a statement to someone, I will love you if, and then we lay out the conditions of that love. The conditions might be, if you let me have my way, or if you bring me presents, yeah, right? Or we might say, I will love you if you do what I tell you when I tell you to do it. You know, that's a demanding love. It's a burden. It is not a blessing, right? Other folks will base their love and their relationship on desirable, happy, nice, present conditions. Uh, this kind of love expresses itself in a, in a statement that says, I love you because, and then whatever that condition is. So it might come as, I love you because, oh, because you're rich. I love you because you're handsome or you're beautiful. Or I love you because you're happy and funny all the time. Well, you know, this conditional love is colder than, remember this line? Peas porridge pot in the nine days old. You know, that kind of love is just blasé. If either one, with either one of these, the bottom line is that you will be loved on condition of your being lovable, right? But a major drawback is that if any one of these required factors 
if any one of these conditions changes or it ends, so does that so-called love. Who wants to be loved like that? Who wants to call a relationship love when it's like the light switch is on or off? Do you? I don't. Who wants to be loved like that? It's about as comforting and, and as desirable as, uh, I don't know, poking yourself in the eye, right? Or hurting yourself just because it's just not a fulfilling relationship. But Jesus brings a different kind of love. Luke recorded an event that demonstrates his new kind of love in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead of the crowd, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. Now when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, Well, he's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. Well, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which, that which was lost. What kind of love is shown in this passage? And what does his love do? Well, it's definitely the love of God, because we remember, as John says in his gospel, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God in flesh and God here on this earth. And so if that is true, then Jesus is the uh, explanation, the, the, the showing and the living of God among people. What does his love do? Well, first we see Jesus shows his love seeks the lost. The smug, the self-righteous self -righteous leaders that were in the crowd that day, they were indignant that Jesus would even stoop so low as to speak so kindly to this treacherous and traitorous tax collector. But you see, Jesus defended his actions and, and he showed his intention, his true intention by saying, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Now remember the audience. These righteous, self-righteous religious leaders were Jews, were Hebrews. But they didn't think that Zacchaeus, a tax collector, was worthy of any of the benefit and any of the, the opportunity that they had for being the leader. Jesus says, salvation has come to him. You know what? He's a Hebrew as well, but you've excluded him. And then he goes on to say, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus took the initiative and looking up into the tree, how many of you remember the little song that we learned in Sunday school and vacation Bible school? Zacchaeus, you come what? Down for I'm going to your house today. A little bit of different wording. But Jesus took the initiative and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down for today I must stay at your house. Now, he didn't say that in a harsh or angry way it wasn't he wasn't impatient he wasn't being a, a commanding voice but rather just think about the fact that he said this to someone whom the rest of the audience the rest of the crowd probably hated 
And imagine his voice saying kindly, Zacchaeus, come on down. Let's go to your house. Full of good humor, full of grace. It was an invitation, not a demand. In the same grace and kindness, Jesus invites us to come to him the same way that, that he spoke to Zacchaeus and to many others in, while he walked on this earth. Jesus doesn't browbeat us. He doesn't berate us. He doesn't shout and bellow out at us. Get out from that tree right now and come with me. That's not Jesus' way. That's not God's way. Jesus came to seek and to save people like Zacchaeus and to seek and save people like you and me. Not to harshly drive us further or Zacchaeus further into lostness, but to call us to himself. Jesus still seeks the lost even today. That the lost could include, oh, those folks who trust their own works, their deeds and their goodness to save them. Maybe those who think that they're beyond saving just because their life has been so bad. Or those who imagine that they're too insignificant on this earth for Jesus to even care about them. Or those who are indifferent to their spiritual condition. They don't know and they don't care. Jesus came to seek the lost like those who are hard-hearted and stubborn and resistant and say, I don't even want to hear what you have to say about this man. Or those whom others have written off, whom others have ostracized and shunned like they did Zacchaeus, or the woman at the well, or the lepers who needed Jesus. Maybe those lost are like the ones who are his enemies and who are angry with him for something that, that he, Jesus, or God, allowed to happen, or something that he prevented from happening in their lives. Remember that the folks in the crowd were as lost as Zacchaeus. But you know what? They weren't aware of it, or they ignored it. But more to the point, where are you in this picture? I know we weren't back in walking in, on the earth and in that crowd that day, but I believe that God's word is just as fresh and as powerful and alive today, and it speaks to us. Are we in that crowd? Are you lost and unaware of it? Or are you just building a wall have, or have built a wall against God? Are you one of the curious, self-satisfied crowd who smugly stands on the sideline and watches as Jesus passes by? Maybe, maybe thinking, oh, I got to see him. But at the same time, rejecting those who, like Zacchaeus, are the ones whom Jesus came to save. Or are you up in the tree, about to have a personal one-on-one -on -one with the one who's calling us to come down because he can save us, and he does save us. Either way, Jesus came to seek you and me even today, but we need to seek him too. You know, recently I heard the story of a father and a, and a young son whose favorite game was to play hide-and-seek. The game always went the same, the story goes. Dad always counted to 100 by fives, and the, the little boy would go off and hide. And then uh, the dad would, would shout out, here comes daddy to find you, Timmy. And Timmy would seem like he didn't, didn't get it. He always would hide in the same room and in the same spot. But of course, dad knew where that spot was, but he always went through the motions of looking in just about every other room before he'd go find him. He'd go into one of the bedrooms and, and shout out, I wonder if Timmy's under the bed. Well, down the hall, he could hear this really low giggle somewhere else in the house. 
as his son was laughing to himself about father looking for him. I wonder if he's in the closet. Again, giggles from the other room. Making his way into the bathroom, dad would say, I wonder if he's in the shower. <laughs> giggles down the way. Or if he's in the toilet and he lifted the seat. The giggles were getting louder though. Out in the hallway, the father proclaimed, I wonder where Timmy could be. Where in, the, where in this house? And about that time, almost every time, Timmy would burst out of his parents' bedroom, coming down the hallway, hollering, Here I am, Daddy! Here I am! And he'd throw himself into his dad's waiting arms. The father telling the story recalls, he would say, almost every time, But Timmy, that's not how the game is played! But Timmy didn't care. That's how he played this game because the object of the game to Timmy was not being found, was in being found, and then to be able to rush into his father's arms. Our Father sent Jesus with the kind of love that seeks the lost. May we rejoice in being found just like Timmy does. His, his is love that seeks and then, secondly, His love saves the worst. Now let that one sink in. We, need, we know that Jesus said He came to seek and to save the lost. But agape love, God's love, Jesus' love is to save the worst. Luke records, He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. Remember, when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a, a sinner. We need to remember that in that day, tax collectors were classed with prostitutes, bad people, criminals, and maybe even Spiders and cockroaches, I don't know, maybe lower. For the most part, the tax collectors earned their despicable reputations. They gouged the people for more than the required Roman tax. They contracted to Rome to collect the taxes to sin, but everything that they collected beyond that required tax, they kept. They were traitors to Israel because they served Rome in such a way while making, most often, making themselves very rich and hated. Compare that with what Paul wrote about himself. Paul wrote to Timothy about his acceptance by Jesus in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy statement, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world, hit this, to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now Paul was not a tax collector, but he, uh, and when he tells his history, he was a Pharisee of the, you know, leader of the Pharisees, a keeper and a teacher of the law. And remember when, uh, what Paul, what Saul was doing when the Lord appeared to him for salvation? He was on a way to another city to persecute and kill the believers. 
And yet God saw someone who was so bad in our eyes and he saved him. Not a single one of us, even if we're here in the church today, deserves the salvation that God gives to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Just like the Romans, uh, Roman letter says, all of us fall short. We've all moved away and fallen short of the glory and the way of God. Every one of us might fall short probably every day in many ways. Our thoughts... They're not always pure. Our speech sometimes is off color, untrue, unkind. Sometimes our actions are less than Christ-like. Our attitudes might be unwholesome. Our motives might be self-serving. But though he certainly does not accept everything that we do and all that we do, and say, and think, and believe. Remember this. God still loves us, and longs for us, and accepts us. Do you believe that? He doesn't love us for any uh, good thing that He sees in us. He doesn't look at us and say, check, 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 okay, you're in. Or because there's something attractive about us, He loves us because He is love. And it's His nature to love. You can get a mini glimpse of at His love for, for you whenever you realize how much and compare it with how much you love your children. Nothing under the sun would make me reject my children or my grandchildren. Oh yeah, they can break my heart, leave me cold, wreck their lives, but they still find acceptance in my heart and in my house. They could cut me into pieces and every piece would still cry out, I love you. Think about this. When we go to a doctor, he accepts us as we are with our wounds, with our broken bones, with our sickness, with our stinky feet, whatever the ailment that we've come in to see the doctor. And then what does he do? He goes to work on us to make us well again. Max Licato wrote, Grace is God as a heart surgeon, cracking open your chest, removing your heart, as poisoned as it is with pride and pain and replacing it with his own. Rather than telling you to change, he creates the change. Do you clean up so that he can accept you? No. He accepts you and begins cleaning you up. His dream isn't just to get you into heaven, but to get heaven into you. What a difference that makes. You know, I appreciate that, pic that word picture that... Max Licato is written because that is God's love. Not just to get us into heaven to spend eternity with Him, but to get heaven into us while we're still here. And so that everything that we do and say shows God's love, the love of Jesus Christ. His is a love that accepts us just as we are, but even more importantly, the third aspect of this new kind of love, His love shapes our lives. Look at Zacchaeus again. Zacchaeus stopped, I think, abruptly, and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, you think about that the tax collector says, if I've defrauded, in his own mind he was doing what was right. But obviously when he was touched and moved and changed by the love of God and love of Jesus, he says, I will give back four times as much. Not just pay it back, but I will make other people better. Remember that neither our good intentions nor our good promises are enough. Zacchaeus had already repented, 
So far, so good. You know, in his own mind, check, 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 he was doing okay. But until he actually did something about it, it was all meaningless. It was all doing it just for the check marks. That wasn't enough. He knew he had to change. Remember that the Bible tells us we must repent or we keep our guilt and we perish. And so God said, Jesus said to those around him, go and sin no more. And then continue to live lives that show true repentance and show God in us. God shapes our lives like the potter that we meet in the, the, the book of Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah wrote in, in Jeremiah 18, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Also, may we say as Isaiah did in Isaiah 64, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We're the clay and you are our potter and all of us are the work of your hand. And may we be like the old, old guy who I read about said, newly converted, newly accepted to uh, the Savior. He says, I ain't what I ought to be, and I ain't what I'm going to be, but praise the Lord, I ain't what I used to be neither. Has the Lord changed us that way? The September 2019 Reader's Digest has a story of a seventh grade girl named Tamara Pierce. She loved to write, scribble out stories for her English class. Her teacher, her English teacher, Mary Jacobson, helped shape her as a writer and encouraged her to read a certain set of fantasy and science fiction books. One time when she wrote a too long short story about Blackbeard for class, Mrs. Jacobson kindly suggested that her assignments for class, or for those assignments, she should put, pick shorter subjects, but to press on in these other things in her spare time. That story says that 40 years later, hearing a Tamora Pierce being interviewed on the radio, Miss Jacobson wondered if it could possibly be the same person that she had taught. Turns out it was. She got Tamora's books. Mary was pleased to read in one novel, I quote, dedicated to the teachers who, shel who, who helped shape my life, end quote. And in the list of four names was Mary Jacobson. The two reconnected by email in which Tamora expressed her, her gratitude for making her feel special and for helping her to believe in herself and a, and a vulnerable time in her life to make her press on. Tamora wrote, she changed my life. Well, let's look at what Jesus does for us. Jesus came with a life-changing, life-shaping love. And he dispenses it in part through you and me. How are you and I impacting the people in our little world? How are we impacting those who are in the congregation sitting around us or maybe not here today? Can you offer a word of encouragement, of thanks and gratitude when you see someone doing something good? Can you help them see what they could be by positive comments on their performance? Can you sincerely tell a self-doubting person, I believe in you? Maybe simple, but maybe those words just might change a life. Jesus brings love that seeks us, love that accepts us, and love that changes us. 
one preacher said in a sermon, to accept people is to be for them. It's to recognize that it is a very good thing that these people are alive and to long for the very best for them. It does not, of course, mean to approve of everything that they do, but it means to continue to want what is best for their souls, no matter what they do. If you compare how Jesus and those self-righteous legalists treat sinners, you'll see that his love does what the self-righteous condemnation and judgmentalism and finger-pointing accusations could not do. Jesus' love produces a changed life. Jesus' love changed and still changes lives. Perhaps Zacchaeus would say, and maybe hopefully each of us would say the words like this poem, I'm just a hunk of nothing, not worth a single cent, but in his eyes I'm worth a lot, so to the cross he went. Not for any good in me did he bring me his love, it was the nature of his heart that sent him from above. Not for any human merit did Jesus bear the pain, it was by grace he gave his life that heaven I might gain. So I can claim his pardon, so grateful that he came to bring to all eternal life. Now I'll never be the same. A new kind of love. A new kind of love in that day, but a love that fills us because Jesus still seeks, saves, and shapes because he still loves with that everlasting love of God. And I'm so glad that Jesus loves even me. Aren't you glad he loves you? What impact has God, has the love of Jesus made in you and for you today? I trust that as we've looked at agape love over these few weeks, and especially seen this new kind of love that changed a man like Zacchaeus, that we can see how he changes us. Even if we've already accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you know, we need to repent and make sure that we allow God, allow Christ, allow His Spirit to help us move and say the right thing, move the right way, say the right things each day. Will you commit yourself to that today? Will you commit yourself to that? Our song of invitation is, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, our Son of God, the solid rock. Is he the solid rock in your life today? We're going to sing this song if you'd like to come forward and commit yourself to him, to re renew your relationship to him, or just to ask prayer for strength and guidance. Will you come as we stand, as we sing?